Now, you do realize this is just the beginnings. It's, um, uh, there's not going to be a huge amount of technology here. I'm not going to take you through selection of components for designing things. Rather, I'm, what I'm going to do is to whet your appetite so that you come back to the next one when I'll actually take you through the design. Um, okay, that's a little bit of my history. It corresponds approximately to bachelor's degree, master's degree, PhD. Approximately. Now, in general, I'm going to assume that you can read faster than I can talk, so I'm not going to read what's on the slides. You're going to read what's on the slides. General studies show that at the very maximum, I can speak at about 120 words a minute. If you're moderately trained, you can read at 300 words a minute. If you're well trained like I am, you can read at 3,000 words a minute, so why should I read it out to you? Okay, when I see the eyes glaze over, I know that you've finished. <laughs> okay. Oh, and in fact, that second one, here it is. I'll pass it around. The, seven, the, the, the IC that's actually on this board is the Philips version. It's the TAA521 of the mu A709. I looked at bringing along the little amplifier that I referred to there that has the 747 driving two pairs of... Um, AD161162, and I thought, no, 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 that's, what am, what am I, what am I trying to do? So I left it at home. Uh, that one was a bit of a highlight for me, getting on with um, the wall. Quite separate from designing the electronics, I also designed the recording studio, and got it down to NC5, a figure that had never been heard of in London before. NC5 means that when people come in, the noise level is 5 dB SPL. When you're asleep, you're putting up with at least 40 dB SPL from all the noise around the vehicle, around your house, animals running around in your ceiling and all that kind of thing, at least 40. But you can sleep through it. Five, you sort of think, where am I? <laughs> okay, this is what um, hopefully you'll get at the end. You've got uh, copies of these slides in the, the blue folder. There you go. Um, what I'd suggest is that um, if something catches your imagination and you want to ask questions, write down your question and have a go at me at the end. Or if you think that the rest of the audience will benefit from your question, then by all means, hop in and give me hell. Now, you might wonder why I've got at the bottom there the nine-tenths of the iceberg and glaciers start carving. That's a ref reference back to my have a go, having a go at climate change, but it's also about the nature of electronics. That what you see on that circuit board is, you know, nine-tenths is hidden. So I'm now going to pass around this board, which I picked up out of a bin. But the reason I'm passing it around is that one of the ICs had the case broken open so you can get an idea of just how big the integrated circuit is. Not that big. Ah, <laughs> uh, no, not that big. Well, no, it's been... Sorry? Smaller now. Oh, they are. Oh, yes, yes. This is a long time ago. This is, this is 7,400 uh, family. Okay, so some of the ideals. Ah. Oh, you've got a copy? Yeah, okay, fine. Right. Okay, good. So by ideals, I mean that these are all at the extreme end. So extremely high open loop gain. Uh, we're talking here of 100,000, 200,000, sometimes even higher. And if you imagine what happens to an integrated circuit that you, you don't have feedback on, you feed in one millivolt, what are you looking at for output if the gain's 100,000? 
Think about it. You can't do it. And if there's the slightest bit of noise at the input to the integrated circuit, even 0.1 of a microvolt, you've got volts coming out unless you've got some control. Now, I'll, shall I refer to these as shibboleths? Would that go over your head? Do you know what a shibboleth is? OK. It's a Jewish word, and it means something that you worship. No, a panacea is, is the ointment that you put on after you got burnt. <laughs> That's when you're experimenting with your soldering iron. <laughs> yes, these are ideals. Yes, that's right. Now, if, if you come to my next one where I actually do some designs, you'll find that I'll actually destroy some of these with real live integrated circuits. Okay, here's some possible applications. Oh, we've been around, is it? Okay, thank you. Um, diddly diddly diddly. Oh, okay. Ah, oh, regulated power supplies. Let me just, where did I put my specs? Ah, oh, here we go. Is that the one? Uh, I think it is, yep, okay. Um, please don't steal them. Um, this is a, 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 it's a, it's about 10 years old, the design. It's a, it's a, a battery charging chip. It uh, can be programmed to handle uh, nickel cadmium, nickel metal hydride, most lithium chemistries, silver lead acid, floating lead acid. All you have to do is, is sort of program with external components. It can discharge, it can equalize balance between cells. So it's, it's the basis of a battery management system. So that's uh, sort of this fella here, regulated power supplies. Okay, now, um, at the end of the, the session, there's a handout, and the handout actually has a list of integrated circuits. But what I've done is I've listed certain kinds of um, specifications, such as the voltage range that they can operate over, the gain range, um, offset bias, temperature stability, all those kinds of things. Most of the ones that I've listed there use um, uh, BJT inputs. Um, but there's, there's one from the TL080 series that uses CMOS. Okay. Okay, here you have the basic op amp circuit. Now, if you had that as a, um, uh, say, uh, a 709, and you, you bought it in the 8 pin dip chip. You know what the, the dip chip is? Dual inline pin, so it's a through hole mounting device. Okay, so we have inside here, you have your amplifier, which goes out to this one. You have the uh, negative, positive, C minus. Uh, no connection, and with, with the 709, which is a, an early device, you also had the possibility of trimming the output to allow for any possible variation in the input. And so this was an external component. You might put, say, a, a 20k ohm pot there. And it'll be a, a set and forget type of thing. So Most. That was setting the offset, was it? That yes. Was nulling out the offset. Correct. Yep. Correct. Yes. I can draw you up the circuit of how it works, but that's getting into the innards, and I've promised in my notes that I won't do that. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> okay. Good. Thank you. Okay. Um, there were many, many chips based on the 709. After this came things like the 741, the 532, 320, 324, 
you know, I can keep on churning out telephone numbers until they, you know, don't worry about it. Oh, here we go. All right. Uh, so let's move on a bit. Okay. Now you may recall from my first slide there that I was involved with the use of um, a DC servo amplifier using 6V6s and a 6SN7. It was all valve job and it was DC coupled all the way through. And when I look at the circuit of that really old stuff, you know, 50 years ago, it was almost the same as you see inside integrated circuits nowadays. Except that instead of valves, it's now transistors. That, yes. Semiconductors, but like mimicking yes, yes, yes. You know why that was? No. Because when you have to get something prepared for space, it has to be ratified, it has to be certified by the FCC and all those other kinds of groups, and it takes a huge amount of time. So they used technology that they knew about and then gradually crept in with the specification changes to introduce, introduce uh, integrated circuits. I mean, you get the same thing with, with drugs, like the COVID-19 drug. It, it's gone through a huge amount of uh, checking before it's released onto the public. The only problem is, with the AstraZeneca one, they didn't test it on a million subjects. And so we're getting the one in a million problems. OK, the, this device doesn't know anything about ground. There's no ground pin on this at all. All it requires is power between these two pins here, and it doesn't care, so long as you don't go outside the range regularly or repeatedly or forever. If you try forever, you better have a good bank manager. Yes? Is that the most common arrangement for, for an 8-pin jet? Yep. The input's there and the output's yes. yep. yep. So you've muffed both the inputs as plus there just by accident. Oh, sorry, you're dead right. You're dead right. Sorry, 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 sorry. So, so the convention is that one would be the negative. In general. Good. Sorry. No, well good. spotted. I like that. No, good on you. Yep. Yes, I, I mean, there's a whole bunch of uh, chips that are based on this. They may not have these offset compensation pins. They may use them for other things like frequency shaping as for instance in the 748. But, okay. Now, one of the problems we have with this device is trying to get some kind of smoothing so that we don't get noise coming in. So one of the ways in which they do this is you'll run a track underneath the device like this. And then right here, you'll put your 100 nanofarad capacitor. So that's what I mean by fitting VCC bypass capacitors. Notice I don't put them down to ground, I put them directly across the rails. Now some people will put them to ground on each side. What happens when you put capacitors in series? Half the value. Okay, right, right, right. Okay. Everybody got that one? I know it's, it's more than five, and so it's difficult to remember, but uh, there'll be a test at the end to make sure we get what you've remembered. Okay, I'm going to now take you through, at a sort of helicopter level, some of these circuits. You've got them in there. Oh, you don't have that one. No, no. Oh, well spotted, Bob. Yes? OK, all right. Now, if there's any of these that catches your fancy and you want me to go into a little bit more depth, then as we get to them, put your hand up and we'll slow down. So the very first one is the buffer circuit. 
And the buffer circuit, as you can see there, we connect the output directly to the inverting input. Copy of the slides. And so that means that this device has a gain of plus one. All right. So you could use it to, say, take a, a high impedance input to transfer it into a low impedance input. So it's a bit like the old cathode follower in valve days. Now, the bit at the bottom there, how to maintain stability, I'll come to that right at the very end. I've got some additional information that you need. So we'll be talking a little bit about what happens on the circuit board, that there'll be unintended capacitors and unintended inductors which can form tuned circuits. And because there's so much gain involved in these things, 100,000, 200,000, they can easily take off. Yeah, any questions on this fella? Nope, okay, let's move on. Here's the inverted, inverting amplifier circuit. Now the difference here is, uh, let's see if I can get this one right. We've got a feedback resistor and an input resistor. Okay, so previously in, the, uh, in this fella, no resistors, no capacitors. This fella, we've got some resistors. And it's called inverting because we're feeding the input into the inverting level here. Now, in order to get V out to swing between the VCC plus and minus rails, we then connect the positive or the non-inverting input directly to ground or you might have a couple of resistors, say 10K each, with 100 microfarad across one of them, across the rails to provide that quasi-ground effect so that you get full swing to positive and negative rails. Now, this is moderately important because when we get onto things like mixers, that input resistance becomes quite important and it's not the input resistance of the device itself. It's that resistor there. Now, the third bu bullet point down there, how many of you know the Jacobi theorem? Thank you. We've got one. Okay. Can you tell us what it is? Okay, I'll, I'll remind you that the, the, the Jacobi theorem says that we get maximum power transfer when the resistance in the generator is equal to the resistance in the load. With these things, if we made the resistance of the input equal to the resistance of our source, we're chucking away half the energy. Is that good thinking? Does the Electricity Distribution Authority follow the Jacobi theorem? Think about it. You've got a 100 amp fuse on your distribution board at home, so that suggests that the incoming impedance to your home is 230 volts over 100, so what's that, 2.3 ohms? It's more likely 0.01 of an ohm, and why is that? So when you turn on the heater and your uh, 10 kilowatt plasma television and your oven and your other cooking apparatus and so on, the voltage doesn't drop. But on the other side, when you turn everything off and you go to sleep, you don't have the mains rising to 460 volts. Okay, noise for KTBR. If you use big resistors for Let's see if we can go there. That fellow there for the feedback resistor, it's taking information from the output 
and feeding it straight back into the input. So if we use a high level of resistor there, and it generates noise, it's going to be added to your input signal. So how to maintain stability, we'll come to that towards the end. The small signal bandwidth determines the maximum frequency that you're likely to get. So let me just give you a little Uh, let's see, how can we draw this? Okay. So this is frequency here and gain here. So if you have an integrated circuit which has a, a gain bandwidth of 1 megahertz, that'll be the 1 megahertz point. And so any other gain that you have in here, this is logarithmic, say 1, 10, 100, say, for instance. So if we have a 1 megahertz gain bandwidth device and you operate it with a gain of 100, what's your bandwidth going to be? 10 kilohertz. How does that come about? It's because of the internal construction of the integrated circuit, that there are capacitors in there, there are, if you like, accidental capacitors, a result of actually making the chip. Yes, indeed. Right. Yes. So when you talk about one megahertz, you're actually talking about one megahertz bandwidth. No, I'm talking about going from, say, one hertz to one megahertz. Right. No, it, it's actually the total frequency. It's a it's a total frequency response. Right. So if if you use say the um, I don't know 741, which happens to actually have one megahertz of bandwidth, then it will run up to one megahertz. If you try to use it in the broadcast band, you'll have a gain of one. But if you run it up to one megahertz, then your gain is going to drop. Yes. So the narrower your bandwidth. The narrower your bandwidth up here, you can get more gain. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you have, say, a gain of 100, say, say you have a dynamic microphone that has an output of one millivolt, and you want to run 100 millivolts into your mixer, then your maximum frequency response here is going to be, you know, you can work it out. Okay. Start again? Yes, 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 that's right. Yeah, that's right. This is the unity gain point here, yes. So when we get up to really smart devices, say, uh, like, um, uh, well, the 5532, it's sort of out here like this. And if you really look after it well, you can get a unity gain bandwidth of 10 megs, which then means that if you want a gain of 100, you can get much broader frequency response. Ah, now, additional filtering. Uh, let's go back a bit. Oops, too far. If I put a capacitor across this feedback resistor here, then I can actually shape the frequency response. So that if I were operating down around here and I didn't want that much bandwidth because I thought there was going to be noise from local broadcasters or whatever, I could put a capacitor across that RF in order to limit the bandwidth. OK. Now the other way up the non-inverting. Now this one looks much the same in, the, in terms of feedback. You've still got feedback resistor RF, input resistor R1, going to ground instead of to the input as we had with the, the previous amplifier. Now the input is fed directly into the non-inverting input. So that this one has a transfer coefficient of the gain of RF over I. Let's have a look. Here we go. Now the input resistance is the input resistance of the device, not the external resistors. 
So if the device has an input resistance of one meg, that's what you're stuck with. Now the transfer function, we'll just go back and you can see why it's 1 plus RF over R1 or RI. It's because we've got a voltage divider all the way across here from the output to ground. And by splitting off this much here, it's R1 over the sum of these two. Again, noise problems if you use a large value of RF. And the stability problem I'll come to later. Bandwidth problems here. Additional filtering, I've already talked about putting the capacitor across the feedback resistor. And we'll come to the large signal bandwidth later. All right, the inverting summing circuit. Now, this is the one that a lot of people use in audio mixing and microphone mixing circuits. The beauty of this thing is you can have several inputs, V in 1 and V in 2, all coming from different sources with different voltage levels. And by varying the relationship between RF and R1, or RF and R2, you can have different levels of gain. So, for instance, we make the RF, say, I don't know, 10 kilo ohms, and we want to uh, use a, a 1 millivolt um, microphone, then we might make R1, say, um, 1K. Now, the microphone might be 200 ohms, and so putting a 1K across it, OK, that's not going to hurt the microphone. It's not going to flatten out or bend the frequency response. We might also want to mix that with a DVD, say in here, where the output is 2 volts, in which case we might go for R2 being another 10K resistor. Now, the beauty of this design is this is known as a virtual ground. All right, so that whatever's coming in here is not going to be affected by this and vice versa. So in other words, if this is your DVD, the signal from the DVD is not going to get into your microphone. So this circuit provides immediate and intense isolation. Now, I've only shown two inputs there. You can put on as many as you like. If you want to make up a Neve mixer with 48 input channels, do it. And they do. Although they may actually group them in tens. You know, ten for the drums, ten for the violins, ten for the cellos, and so on. And then they have another mixer after that for grouping them all together to drop them onto a DVD. Okay. Now, the phase performance and noise, again, I'll come to that at the end. And the stability problem as well. Talked about the additional filtering of putting the capacitor across the feedback resistor. And I've talked about the negligible crosstalk because the inverting input of the IC is at virtual ground. Ah, now, this is an interesting one. That little circuit board that I sent around is actually a difference amplifier. And in that particular case, R1 and R2 are exactly the same. And VN1 and VN2 are the two leads of a microphone that's coming in as a balanced lead. Now, it needn't be a microphone. It could be a temperature probe. It could be a seismic probe. It could be something coming in off your wind generator that's telling you, you know, speed of wind so that your weather reporting system works. But wherever you want to eliminate the possibility of mains frequency interfering with your signal, you use balanced leads and you use this circuit. Because the common mode rejection ratio, in other words, the rejection of a signal on both of these interfering with each other is probably about 100 dB. Do 
let's move on. OK, so here's your transfer function, a little bit more complex. Normally, we'd make the, the two feedback resistors the same and the two input resistors the same so that the whole thing has the same gain all the way through. And we probably choose those resistors from either a 1% pack or perhaps a 0.1% pack so that we don't degrade the common mode rejection. OK. Yes? Since in that uh, circuit, one of them has a virtual ground and the other one doesn't. Yep. Does that, um, so the, the two equations you have for the gain in the positive section and the negative section, the two equations are not the same. They, they really are because of the way in which you, you feed back. If you feed back too much, you're going to get a Schmidt trigger, and you don't want that kind of thing. You know a Schmidt trigger? Yeah, no, what I mean is the, yeah. the gain in the, um, uh, the gain yeah. in the Yeah, OK, we can understand that one. That's fine. And this one is to ground. Yeah, that's what I mean. And this one is to ground rather than to the output. So we don't have a Schmidt trigger effect. Yeah, now the, uh, okay, gotcha. Okay, happy? Yeah, okay. Okay, good, good. Okay, now we're actually deliberately introducing a capacitor across the feedback resistor. And we're going to charge that capacitor, and that's going to take time to charge up and add the inputs that are coming in on V in. Now, it's inherently unstable because it will just keep on adding and adding and adding. And if there's any noise coming in, from whatever reason, whether it's inside the integrated circuit, or whether it's from your mains leads, or whether it's the neighbor's dog barking, whatever, it'll just keep on adding that noise up and up and up. And so we need an adjustable reference there so we can cancel out that incoming noise. So you can use it, say, for an antenna rotating unit. So you use this to sense where your antenna is pointing and to compare that with where you've set your pointer so it then sends current to the motor to achieve the right place. You could use it if you wanted to. You could have a push button every time the, the neighbor's dog barks, and it would add up the number of times that the dog barks. And you could then take the data to your neighbor and say, oi, next time it barks, I'm going to the cops. But of course, you wouldn't do that because you want to be a good neighbor. So you'd, you'd offer the, the dog some a palliative, like uh, a Glock or uh, a Schmidt or, um, sorry, did I go over your head? Do you know what a Glock is? Yes. <laughs> Sorry? Don't go there. Okay, all right. No, I, you know the 19 is a lighter one than the 17. <laughs> okay. Now, if we go back to the previous circuit, the RF in parallel with, with C1 sets the upper frequency limit over which it will actually operate. That's this piece here, OK? Uh, all right, OK? Questions on that so far? All OK? We can race ahead. We can do a differentiator next. Ah, I remembered. <laughs> A differentiator is the kind of thing that you might use for taking the sensing off the um, differential of your motor car to feed to the speedo. Or you might take it off the back of the camshaft to feed to your rev counter. So it's differentiating the number of pulses with respect to time. Fairly simple circuit. Same sort of gain problems as all the others. And it'll be smaller than that chip that was 
broken there. And it'll be buried in the, the flexible circuit board in behind the dashboard of your car and you won't be able to fix it. I can bet. Okay, because we're feeding into the inverting input, the transfer function is minus RF, C1, dV, dT, normal differential stuff. Now the RF needs to be fairly large, probably 500k to a meg or so. Why is that? Sorry? Okay, let's let's go back. All right. We're differentiating, remember, so we're, the result is going to get smaller and smaller as we have more and more pulses coming in. So that's why we want as much gain as possible. But putting the capacitor across RF also limits the upper frequency limit. 3 dB points about you know, half, an, half an octave away. Now, if you're into designing all kinds of audio circuits, or maybe even RF circuits, where you want to, say, um, cut out the um, community broadcasters that are coming in at sort of 1700 kilohertz, you can design something that has a sharp cutoff. Oh no, it's high pass. Sorry, wrong way, wrong way. High pass goes the other way, it goes that way. So it's, it's when you want to cut out the mains noise, then you would use a circuit like this. Now, it looks very much like a differentiator, doesn't it? Very much. And it is. It's much the same kind of thing. Except that now, instead of feeding in a relatively slow signal, we're feeding in something that's moving a bit faster. And we're back down to relatively normal values of RF and R input. The one I've given you there is a 20 dB per octave design. Um, you'll find in uh, broadcasting studios, for instance, where they're still broadcasting in the AM band, they'll have a uh, what they call a brick wall filter, where they cut off all audio above four and a half kilohertz. And so they'll have three or four of these in series, 20, 40, 60 dB per octave. I've got a little board at home, I should have brought it. It's got 10 of these around and it's just one filter of this kind to give the brick wall effect. Now, the point there, the first time I've mentioned this, the RF, the feedback, actually loads the output. So you can see from here, you've got output voltage here, feedback goes to the virtual ground here. So this is providing an additional load as well as the load you have out here. So you've got to decide whether the integrated circuit that you're using has enough current handling capacity to handle your feedback as well as your load. Okay, how would you invert the phase? Any ideas? Can you just feed the negative input? Ah, let's have a look and see if we can do that. We're already coming into the negative input. Okay. And we've got already we've got 180 degrees phase change between input and output. Can you add a that'll only give you 90 degrees maximum. Sure. <laughs> it's still seen as one capacitor. <laughs> this is a real problem when you're designing, say, uh, uh, what do I call it? Say you're triamping. In other words, you've got an out and a loudspeaker system where you've got uh, a sub bass, uh, a mid range, a tweeter. Maybe you go to four and you'll have a really high frequency, say, a, a ribbon type of speaker. And you want to have all of these high pass and low pass filters all coming out of your amplifier, but only going to 
one amplifier per speaker. Then you want to be sure that the phase of those circuits is exactly the same when it gets to the speaker. So if you want to have a band pass filter, say for your mid-range, so you're going to use a low pass and then a high pass, then you're back to having it going straight through. But all the others are going to be inverted. So what do you do? You put in a buffer, which gives you inversion. And if you use something like a 747 or a 5532, there's two chips on board. So you use one to do your filtering and the other one to do your inversion. OK, why are we going to use low resistance values? It starts with a 4. No, no. 4 KTBR. The bigger the resistor, the more noise you're going to get feeding into this device. So small resistors, less noise. And as with the previous ones, we can put a capacitor across the feedback resistor to actually shape the performance. Now, here's the other way up. A low pass. Slightly different configuration. Again, 20 dB per octave. Oh, sorry, 20 dB per, per decade. And your R and C determine the, the corner frequency, the, the 3 dB point. So the transfer function gets a little bit more complex. I'll, I'll test you on this at the end, make sure you've all remembered it. <coughs> the cutoff frequency, 1 over 2 pi RC, is ultimately dependent on what? Hint, hint. Yes, yes. And again, we know why we want low resistance values, noise. So to design a bandpass filter, where you actually have control over the, the um, upper and lower frequencies, my preferred way is to use two ICs in series. So a high pass filter, then a low pass filter, and then out. If you go the other way, you get nothing. Think about it. You put the low-pass filter in, there's nothing. <laughs> there, there are circuits around where you can have a band-pass filter that's run with just one integrated circuit. But it's very difficult to arrange the center frequency and the upper and lower levels. You can do it. If you come to my next series, I'll take you through the design of that. It's more complex. You'll, you'll need to sort of bring a cut lunch. Aha, now we have a nonlinear circuit. A half wave rectifier. What would you use this for? Detector. Yes. AM detector. Yes, an AM detector would certainly do, yes. Correct. Well spotted. Yes, yes. Why? Why don't we lose the, the diode drop? Well, because they've got the gain. No, no. It's because the diodes are within the loop. Yeah. Now, we can alter the phase relationship, whether we get the, the upper or the lower half of the cycle, by polarizing these two diodes. And they should both be pointing one way or the other. OK, this is the kind of circuit you'll find in a, uh, uh, a PPM. That, that's the kind of meter that you'll find on very expensive Neve desks, where the, the, the meter comes up and stays at your peak level for whatever time characteristic you choose, say one second and drops down. 
compared with a VU meter, which jumps all over the place, and because of the ballistics of the meter needle, you don't know what the peak has been. I can well remember I was um, doing an interview with a fellow at a, a quarry where they were blasting away in the background, and I was using a very good quality uh, recorder, and I'd set the, the meter needle so I got the voice right and all that kind of thing. When we played it back, the voice was completely gone because of the noise of the blasting. Because I'd been following the VU meters. If I'd been using a PPM, I would have set the mic gain lower and I would have got the guy to swallow the mic rather than hold it between the two of us. Okay, so you've got an idea of why you, you'd want a peak detector. Uh, and the polarity question, directions of the diodes. Why are we using, you notice in the circuit diagram, I've labeled them SD, that's Schottky diode. Why did I choose a Schottky diode? Because there's less Sorry? Less voltage Correct, yes. A, a Schottky diode in a circuit like that probably has about 100 millivolts drop across it, compared with silicon about 600 to 700, germanium around 200. But there's a problem if you use Schottky. What's that? Reverse Sorry? Reverse leakage. Yes, absolutely. Reverse leakage. But do you care about losing 600 millivolts anyway? Because you've got, you know, you've got rails and bolts and, and so on. Does it matter? It's, it's all, as you said before, it's all in the loop. Sure. It's just that most people use the Schottky diodes because they're only using for a very short period of peak detection. If you use it for long-term things like, say, measuring the mains voltage, then you would go to a 1N4148 or a 914, that kind of thing. Frequency response is the other thing? Sorry? Oh, Frequency response is the other thing? Sure. Yes, that's right. Yes, yes. Uh, all right. So it's pretty smart. It can detect down to 0.2 of a millivolt, peak to peak. So that's 70 microvolts. All right. Okay, now we were, I, I promised you I'd talk about stability problems, all right? So, if we have any kind of delay between the output and the non-inverting input, we're going to get these kinds of problems here. So you have a lot of delay here, small amount of delay, and here's our perfect response where it just comes up and settles. That's the response that we want. Okay, so if we have something that causes a delay, a capacitor in that feedback loop from the output to the input, or the inductance of the circuit board, the current going into an inductor is going to charge the inductor, it'll delay what gets out the other end. Current going into a capacitor, there's a delay before the voltage develops at the other end. And there's worse. Say you do have a capacitor on the output here. Say you, you want to use it because you think it's going to cut off the high frequency noises. But inside, the resistor in here might be, say, 75 to 100 ohms unless you're buying some of the more expensive chips like the 5534, which has an output resistance of around about 0.5 of an ohm. Then, of course, that's why it can operate out like here. Now, the one that I've labelled B here is the one where we have accidental problems to do with layout of the circuit board, where you have inductance in the tracks and where you have capacitance between the components. So in all of these cases, you're going to get that uh, 3dB point, 1 over 2 pi RC, and depending on where it comes in, in this fella here, you may start getting some bouncing around of the signal, which almost nothing you can do about it except 
got to the wall switch and turn it off. Okay, I think that's just a few little words of warning about integrated circuits. They're not perfect. In spite of my putting up those shibboleths at the front edge, in fact, they do have limitations. <laughs>